The rest of you could turn to 1 John chapter 3 if you would. I'm going to go fast and furious. Lord, bless this word. Anoint our hearts with it and help us to understand Christmas. In Jesus' name, amen. I thought that I was just going to cruise through the Christmas story. And, uh, well, I just can't do that. I went to Luke chapter 2, which is what... Yeah, the average person today, no matter where you are, that's what they're doing. They're reading the Christmas story. I would ask all of you to read the Christmas story before you ever touch a package on Christmas morning. Amen. Go over that story. That's important. Because right now I'm going to take another different view of Christmas. First John chapter 3. Two times in First John we're told why Christmas happened. It wasn't for you to receive all the stuff that you received today. First John chapter 3, verse 5, and we'll be skipping around a little bit. It says, Ye know that it was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Why did he come? And I'm going to be constantly going back, and when I look down, I want you just to imagine a little baby here, because it said that he came. He came. He left his place, and he came. And that's what we're concentrating on today. He came he, to take away the sins of the world. He was manifested. Why? To take away our sins. Manifested means that's the reason he came. He became flesh and dwelt among us. So he wants to take away your sin. In him, there is no sin. So as a little baby, here he is, and he said, he came to take away your sin. In him, there is no sin. He's going to grow up all of his life absolutely sinless. And then they're going to put him on the cross, and all at once, he's going to bear at once. A person that was absolutely sinless will bear all the sins of the world because he's the only one that was sinless, he'll take them upon himself and it says that he became sin for us and that sin was destroyed on the cross. And we'll talk about that. You think Christmas is not important? You got another thing coming. And the second part of verse eight in 1 John chapter three said, he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, here we have it again. The Son of God was manifested. He came in the flesh, what for? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Take away your sin, destroy the works of the devil. From the very beginning, God created something. He looked at it and said, this is good. The devil came in, boom, sin entered into the world. Was it a part of a plan? Yeah, it was a part of a plan for you to be able to choose or not choose, sure. But he was manifested for two reasons, the Bible says. As a baby, here he lies. As a creator of the world. To take away your sin, that's number one. And to destroy the works of the devil. See, for you to be able to make it, for you to be able to grasp it, to, to, to make it through life, then what the Lord had to do is he had to destroy what the devil was doing. And you say, well, the devil's all over out there. Well, there's a difference. You see, when 69 times in the New Testament talks about the kingdom of God, doesn't even mention it in the Old Testament. But the New Testament, all of a sudden we got the kingdom of God. When Jesus came, he said, hey, the kingdom of God is near. <laughs> it's at hand. You're looking at it. I came from the kingdom of God. It's a different place for all of us to imagine, different place for all of us to think, different place for our hearts to be the kingdom of God. But he said, this kingdom of God has come. And now you can be a part of the kingdom of God, which is different than the world that we live in today. Praise God. If you want the world that we live in today, you're already in trouble. 
But there's a kingdom of God that is present amongst us. And that's a powerful thing. In Matthew chapter 1 and 18 says, so Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. If you take away a virgin birth, you take away salvation. Did you know that? You see, you've got to believe in that virgin birth. That's the miracle, and we're going to find that out. The miracle is him being a baby right there. Him coming into this universe and doing what he did. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was, look at what he did. He was minded to put her away privately or privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. It's of the Holy Ghost. And then in Luke chapter 2, at the end of the chapter, in verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. See, he was perfectly obedient. He was perfect in all of his ways. There's no way that you and I can go forward without, in our walk with the Lord and in our salvation without recognizing a virgin birth and without recognizing that that was the Messiah that that was God in the flesh right there. If you don't realize that, then I'm going to get into this in a minute. Then I'm going to say that you still need to go backwards before you ever go forwards. You, you got to go back here, and we'll prove that in a minute. Jesus was born for us to be transformed. You're mortal. Nothing you can do about that. You're going to live, you're going to die. So he was born so you could be transformed. And it starts with your own mind. You're transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you can prove it is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, as he, as he read this morning. But then another transformation is your change from mortality to immortality. And that happens in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51. Something's going to happen to you where actually you become from this kingdom to that kingdom. Boom! You're a part of it. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, look not at every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, talking about God, of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a what? Right there. That's where that form started. God. You got to go back to that to go forward. So he's made in the likeness of men. Being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So what they're talking about is God became flesh and that baby went to the cross for you and I. It's a fact. If you don't believe that, you have a problem with your salvation. And I'll prove that. Jesus wasn't conformed to this world. He came to transform us from it. Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, for this is your reasonable service. We already read in verse 2. Remember, he came to destroy the works of the enemy in individual lives that are living in the kingdom of God. In my life, I could be absolutely calm and trusting him that in my life, he's already destroyed the works of the enemy. I just have to stand where he tells me to stand, be where he wants me to be. I play my son on, on our phones, Battleship. And it's interesting. If God says, stand right here, back up, Tim. Why? Because I'm just being obedient. I'm just moving where God wants me to move. I'm being absolutely obedient, knowing what? Knowing that God is in control. If he tells me to back up, then I know that the enemy, he's, he's constantly throwing missiles. 
But it's okay. God has us. He has a plan. Luke 10, 9 says, And heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Who is that kingdom of God? Where did it start? And how does it get around? You see, the kingdom of God started right here. And this began the process of that which is eternal coming into that physical universe that we live in. That kingdom into this kingdom. And then he, upon leaving this kingdom, left the ability for you to accept something from that kingdom inside of you. And that's your ticket. That's your ticket. Standing at the pearly gates. Maybe it'll be Peter. Maybe it'll be Paul. He'll look at Sharon. Sharon, you got your ticket? She'll say, check my heart. Check my heart. Go up to Jamie. Jamie, you got your ticket? Search me, oh God. See if there be anything. Royce, where's your ticket? His name, ready for this? Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. I don't need to worry about it anymore. I've come into this world for a short amount of time, a little bit of vapor just going through. You can smell me as I go. <laughs> little vapor. Phew, that was pastor. <laughs> so there's a little flower that just comes up, just looks good for just one little moment. And I hope that this little flower that came up, I hope that the staff at this body only shows you a picture of who Christ really is. The kingdom of God is only in the New Testament. It's 69 times because he's speaking of the church. Why? Because that kingdom is only here because the Holy Spirit has infiltrated your life. That's what makes up the kingdom of God. You have to have the Holy Spirit in your life. Ephesians 2.2 2 says, Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is the prince of the power of the air? The devil is. Satan is. That's the way that you walk. So in order for you to understand first that you've got a problem, you have to know that's who you walked with. You say, well, I never walked with him. If you're not walking with Christ, that is who you're walking with. It's either one or the other. You pick. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So it now defines the people that don't believe in this. And, and again, I'll prove that to you in a minute. The people that don't believe in this find themselves in disobedience. If you do believe in that and you believe in that miracle, then all the rest of it's really easy. If you believe in a virgin birth, the rest of it's easy. Why? Because you've never seen one yet. Outside of that. <laughs> Have you? Back to the text because you know how I am. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Nothing we did, everything that he did. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Behold, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. That, my friend, is cool. If you don't get that, that's the kingdom of God. When we see him, we're going to be like him. Why? Because he's here. We're all going to look alike. I mean, we'll have our own bodies. They'll be changed. But we're all the body of Christ. And so how dare us make any judgment on another person in the body of Christ? You're talking about the body of Christ. 
Why must we be born again? John chapter 3 and verse 36. He that believeth on the, and this is very important. He that believeth on the Son. I'll point to it. Have everlasting life. Now that's easy to know. You can't misinterpret that. If you don't believe in this, it all stops right there. You want to talk about the importance of Christmas? If you don't believe in Christmas, this, then you don't have everlasting life. <laughs> and that's the truth. They're trying to do away with Christmas. Why? Because if they could do away with Christmas, if they could do away with the Son of God coming and manifesting on earth, then they do away with everything after that. That's what they're going for. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you don't believe that, then you might as well stand over here where the wrath of God is. Because over here, these people believe and these people don't. And it's literally believing in the Son of God. It didn't even get into all the doctrine right here. It just says, do you believe in the Son of God? Well, here's the Son of God. Well, <laughs> yeah, but well, how does that save me? Just because I believe in the Son of God. So if you believe in the Son of God, then he was manifested to what? To take away your sin. He was manifested to what? Which means he became this person to destroy the works of the enemy. So now if you believe in the Son of God, you now believe what? That the enemy has been destroyed and your sins have been forgiven. Without knowing about Christmas, you don't know where to go. You don't have salvation. You don't have forgiveness. And that's scripture. Christmas is so important. Happy holidays. Hogwash. Amen. Merry Christmas. This is about Jesus. Do you know what Jesus did for you? If you came to me and said, I don't really believe in Christmas. We don't practice Christmas. We don't. Let me tell you something. You don't practice knowing that. Then the Bible says that you're standing on the side where wrath is going to happen. You've got to believe that. Don't let anybody. I don't care if you have a tree and all the lights and all. That's not Christmas. That's just little things that we put up for it. That's Christmas. And if you don't believe in that, you're going nowhere. <laughs> Jesus' birth and our new birth are parallel themes through, through Scripture. Boy, I was going all this. I got so much Scripture here, I won't even touch it. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ. So the man Jesus is the Messiah, born of a virgin as a baby. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And listen to this. And everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. You love God? You love that baby that's right there. Let's go on because I'm going to prove some other things here. That means that the Holy Spirit causes people to be born again with a view to having faith in the virgin birth of a man that has God as a father and a virgin woman as a mother. If you believe that, how e easy is it to believe in all the rest? And that's my point. Everything funnels down to my belief right here. Did he come to destroy the works? Did he manifest himself to destroy the works of the devil? Did he manifest himself to take away our sin? Yes or no? Because that's everything hinges on this right here. And that's the thing that the world doesn't like. Even though they capitalize on it. First John chapter 4 and verse 2. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. And this I want you. Put it up there. Open your Bibles to it if you want. Mark it right at the edge of your Bible if you want, but I want you to know this. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit. This is how you know the Spirit of God in a person's life. Are you ready for this? 
every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That came in the flesh. That's what it says. Is of God. And if they don't believe that, then they have the spirit of Antichrist. If you don't believe that this happened, then you are anti-Christ. You have that spirit. Well, how do we know that? Well, that's what it says. In verse 3, And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you've heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. It's that important to believe in the birth of Jesus. And in fact, if you can't believe that, then you're not of God. That's exactly what this says. It all starts here. Everything hinges on your belief system and your faith in this happening right here. God was manifest in the flesh in Jesus. Happy birthday. And here we are celebrating it today. I got so much scripture, but I'm going to skip over that for one thing. It's a story that I'm going to read to you. Many of you have heard it. But, and you already know the ending of it. But I'm still going to give it to you. Because I still want you to digest this big. Years ago, there was a very wealthy man who with his devoted young son, they shared a passion for art collecting. Together, they traveled around the world, adding only the finest art treasures to their collection. Priceless work. Picasso, Van Gogh, Monet, many others adorn the walls of the family's estate. The widowed elder man looked on with satisfaction as his only child became an express, or experienced art collector. The son's trained eye and sharp business mind caused his father to beam with pride as they dealt with art collectors around the world. As winter approached, war engulfed the nation and the young man left to serve his country. After only a few short weeks, his father received the telegram his beloved son was missing in action. The art collector anxiously awaited more, year, more news, feared he would never see his son again. Within days, his fears were confirmed. The young man had died while rushing a fellow soldier to a medic. Distraught and lonely, the old man faced the upcoming Christmas holidays with anguish and sadness. The joy of the season, a season that he and his son had so looked forwardly to, would visit his house no longer. And on Christmas morning, a knock came on the door, awakened the depressed old man as he walked to the door. The masterpieces of art on the walls only reminded him that his son was not coming home. As he opened the door, he was greeted by a soldier with a large package in his hand. He introduced himself to the man by saying, I was a friend of your son. I was the one that he was rescuing me and getting me to a medic when he died. May I come in for a few moments? I have something that I would like to show you. And as the two began to talk, the soldier told of how the man's son had told everyone of his, not to mention his father's love of fine art. I'm an artist, said the soldier. I want to give you this. And as the old man unwrapped the package, the paper gave away to reveal him nothing but a portrait of his son. Though the world would never consider it a work of genius, the painting featured the young man's face in striking detail, overcome with emotion. The man thanked the soldier, promising to hang that picture over the fireplace. A few hours later, after the soldier had departed, the old man set about his task. True to his word, the painting went well above the fireplace, pushing aside thousands of dollars worth of paintings. And then the man sat in the chair and spent Christmas gazing at the gift that he had been given. During the days and weeks that followed, the man realized that even though his son was no longer with him, the boy's life would live on because of those he had touched. He would soon learn that his son had rescued dozens of wounded soldiers before a bullet stilled his caring heart. As the stories of his son's gallantry continued to reach him, 
Fatherly pride and satisfaction began to ease the grief and the painting of his son soon became the most prized possession that he had. It far eclipsed any interest in any of the other pieces around any of the museums, even around the world. He told his neighbors it was the greatest gift that he had ever received. The following spring, the old man became ill and he passed away. The art world now was in anticipation. Unmindful of the story of the man's only son, but in his honor, those paintings would be sold at an auction. According to the will of the old man, all the artworks would be auctioned on Christmas Day, the day he had received his greatest gift. The day soon arrived and art collectors from all around the world gathered to bid on some of the most prized collections from all around the world. Dreams would be fulfilled this day. Greatness would be achieved. As many claim, I have the greatest collection. The auction began with a painting that was not on any museum list. It was the painting of the man's son. The auctioneer asked for an opening bid. The room was absolutely silent. Who will open bidding with $100, he asked. Minutes passed. No one spoke. From the back of the room, somebody said, who cares about that painting? It's just a picture of his kid. Let's forget it and go to the good stuff. More voices echoed in agreement. No, we have to sell this one first, replied the auctioneer. Now, who will take the sun? Finally, a friend of the old man spoke. Will you take $10 for that painting, sir? It's all I have. I knew the boy, and I'd like to have that. I have $10. Will anybody go higher, call the auctioneer? After more silence, the auctioneer said, going once, going twice, gone. The gavel fell. Cheers filled the room, and somebody said, now we can finally get down to the valuable treasures. The auctioneer looked at the audience and he announced, the auction is now over. Stunned, disbelief quieted the room and someone spoke up and asked, what do you mean it's over? We didn't come here for a picture of the old man's son. What about all of these paintings? There are millions of dollars of art here. I demand that you explain what's going on here. The auctioneer replied, it's very simple. According to the will of the father, whosoever takes the son gets it all. I don't need to tell you. I don't need to try to explain that story to you. I think you got it. You see, if you don't believe in the Son, then you don't believe in the Father. You don't believe in the Son, it says that you are a person of wrath over here because of your disbelief. But if you really do believe in Christmas, and you really do believe that that story of God coming to this earth is in fact real to take away the sins of the world and to destroy the works of the devil, then that belief system says that that is where your actual faith will start. That's your starting point. And from there, now you take on the sun, everything else is yours. Stand with me if you would. Merry Christmas. I want this congregation to be the best example in the world, out in the public. We've had two full services today. That gives us over, over 600 people have come in this place today. And we should be able to make a difference by taking that story right there to anybody else. Do you believe in Christmas? Do you really believe in Christmas? And if you do, can't you tell somebody else what Christmas is? Because Christmas is simple. He was manifest 
to take away our sin. He was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to pray. And if there's anybody in this room that just wants to come and you want to actually get down and say, you know what, this Christmas, my life is going to be changed. This Christmas, I dedicate my life solely to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to believe and I want to start my faith out right now. This is where it starts. You're more than welcome to come. No greater honor for God than on his birthday that we celebrate. Doesn't have to be his exact day. But on the birthday that we celebrate, no greater honor would Jesus have than to know that you have dedicated your life to him on that day because he dedicated his life for you. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you will bless this congregation with the ability to have wisdom and knowledge of what I just spoke on. Lord, I pray that this little babe that was in the manger had so much power upon him, so much anointing upon him, Growing up, he could have done whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, however he wanted, and he still took it all the way to the cross to experience life so he could judge us in the end properly. So that he knew that if we really want to choose God and we really want to believe, we can do it. How do we know that? Because he did it. He came to destroy the works of the enemy. Do we believe that? Lord, I ask that this Christmas we would go out with victory. This Christmas, families would be restored. Homes would be restored. Marriages would be restored. Because I believe in Christmas. I believe in the birth of Christ. I believe that it was a virgin birth. I do believe that he came to take away the sins of the world. I believe that he went through everything on this earth that we could ever imagine. And I believe that he who had no sin became sin for us. And all of that sin was destroyed on the cross through the love of Jesus Christ. That's our break. That's our chance. That's how we do it. Lord, bless the ones who don't believe. Somehow you're going to have to grab their hearts, Lord, and help us to touch them. This isn't a holiday. This is Christmas. It's a holy day. So, Father, bless us today for your service. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Merry Christmas to all of you. Enjoy Christ and enjoy your families.